Want to know how Canada's top industry leaders feel about creating significant wealth in the world around them? Find out with me, Thane Stenner, founder of Stenner Wealth Partners at Canaccord Genuity and host of the new Smart Wealth Podcast. Available on iHeart or anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. Subscribe now. Hello, everybody. My name is Thane Stenner. I'm the host of the BNM Bloomberg Smart Wealth Podcast, where I get to interview some of the leading minds in different industries and sectors. And I'm with a very special guest here today, David Rosenberg. David, first of all, thank you for taking the time out of your very, always very busy schedule uh, to be with us today. Pleasure to be here. Excellent. And there's going to be lots for us to talk about. For those of you who've been listening to the podcast, uh, David and I had uh, an interview uh, podcast last year around the same time in August. And uh, as is usual, David is very forthright with his comments, uh, forecasts and whatnot. And I think uh, if you haven't listened to him before, you're going to really be in for a treat here today. So um, with that in mind, I'll start off by, by providing a little bit of uh, David's bio uh, to begin with, and then, you know, give a little bit of background uh, as well around him. So David uh, is the founder and president of Rosenberg Research an economic and financial market uh, consulting firm, which he established back in January of 2023. So, so first of all, David, the last three and a half years, uh, does it feel like uh, since you set up shop, independent shop, have things been, does it feel like three and a half years ago or, or has time flown for you? Oh, it's, it's as if nothing happened. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit of COVID yeah. and a recession and whatnot, exactly. Well, prior prior to creating his own company, David was also the chief economist and strategist with Gluskin Chef and Associates from 2009 to 2019, so roughly 10, 11 years. And prior to that, from 2000 to 2009, he was at Merrill Lynch, uh, where uh, for the first two years, he was the chief Canadian economist and strategist based out of Toronto. And for the last seven years, he was the chief North American economist at Merrill Lynch in New York, where he was consistently ranked in the top three of all Wall Street economists polled by the annual institutional investors. And actually, this is where David and I, uh, I think, first met was roughly over 20 years ago when, when I was also at Merrill Lynch or earlier on in my career. David is also a frequent contributor to most major financial newspapers and publications in North America and makes regular TV appearances in the financial media. He received his both his BA and MA in economics from the University of Toronto. So he's a fellow Canadian based in Toronto these days, but uh, very much with a, a global uh, footprint on, on how he thinks. So for full disclosure, um, David, uh, his, his research of his team, um, we're also a, a subscriber, uh, as a, as an investment group, uh, Stenner Wealth Partners here, part of CG Wealth Management. And I have to tell you that their research that they publish on a, on a very consistent basis is some of the very best that we get access to on a global basis. So keep up the great work, David and, and team. But uh, there's a piece that I'll refer to uh, as we go through some of the questions. It's called Breakfast with Dave. And I think Dave, you've had that piece named that for, I think it literally goes right back 20 plus years, doesn't it? Well, it changed um, monikers along the way. Uh, I started that when I was working at the uh, Bank of Montreal back in uh, 1997. Uh, yes. And it was called uh, something uh, uh, a little, shall we say, uh, less sexy or a little more boring. I was called. Uh, well, actually, I was. I was called Morning Market Memo uh, because uh, I love alliterations. Gotcha. Uh, but you know the 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 uh, the folks at Glasgow Chef they like to uh, jazz things up. So uh, and uh, why not introduce uh, some food into the uh, into the vortex? So um, <laughs> Breakfast of Dave. So actually, I would say Breakfast of Dave. Uh, that title's been here since two thousand and nine. Oh, and fantastic. and. I kept the trademark when I started my business. I, I figured you did. It's a very smart move on your part. You're a good businessman as well. Well, actually, one of the things I missed saying in your bio is you, uh, Rosenberg Research right now, as an independent research group, you've got something like 2,600 clients, both retail and institutional globally now? 
Well, it's uh, glad to say it's up to 2,800. Wow. Uh, when when I left Gluskin Chef in uh, January of 2020, uh, and this was w- one of the benefits of um, having a business within a business because I had 1,600 uh, of my own clients. They were not Gluskin Chef clients. These are people that did not want money management. Um, they did that on their own. They, they wanted um, to have uh, advice given to them. Hmm. So I, I started the business. I had 1,600 clients. Uh, we're up to 2,800 uh, in just over three years. Wow. And uh, half our clients are institutions, half are private investors. Yep. And uh, we're, we're in 40 countries. So we, we truly are uh, a, uh, a multinational organization. Wow, Not fantastic. that big, but we're still yeah. multinational. <laughs> Absolutely. How many people on the research team these days? Well, in total, I have um, 16 or 17 people. I always wonder, should I include myself or not? <laughs> uh, we uh, we have um, probably, uh, I think, uh, eight on the research side. And the other, call it uh, eight or nine people, you know, we have uh, technology and we have marketing. We have sales, uh, admin, obviously. Uh, my son, Jacob, uh, is the de facto uh, COO. Uh, he doesn't like the word chief in his name, so he's head of operations, but I still call him COO because I'm old school and I suppose I have a little bit of Larry David in me. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so in any event, yeah, so it's about, I'd say about, uh, eight people doing both strategy and economics. And of course, uh, mm-hmm. always marrying the two and doing our best to come up with, uh, with, uh, advice and recommendations on, uh, how to navigate through these, uh, crazy markets, which are are always crazy. It's always just a matter of degree. I absolutely agree. And uh, both you and I have been in the business long enough to know that to kind of expect craziness at different times. So with that in mind, you know, you and I chatted about a year ago, almost to the day. And um, you were very open with your perspectives back then. So first question for you is, uh, what would you say you from a forecasting perspective that you felt like you got right over the course of the last year from, you know, August, 2022 to, to these days, what, what are the things that you'd, you'd say? Yeah. We kind of nailed those things. Well, I guess there, there's a couple, uh, there's stuff that I nailed stuff that I missed, but, uh, I think that's always, uh, the case, um, with, uh, uh, you know, prognosticators because, uh, <laughs> you know, as, as Yogi, probabilities yogi yogi bear famously said uh it's tough making predictions especially about the future so yep. uh i'd say that um you know having been part of that transitory camp on inflation uh and then getting pasted as we went from zero uh to nine percent uh in pretty short order uh it was practically unprecedented uh to have four years of price increases uh just lumped in a one year. It's never yep. happened before. Um, and so I'd say that the one call that I got right is, you know, I, I kept on saying that this 9% inflation rate, which was the peak back in June of uh, 2022, that that was not sustainable. Uh, it was not going to lead to a relentless wage price spiral. This is not going to be a new era of inflation. And of course, the debate back then and there's new debates today, uh, was whether or not we were entering into the 1970s. Mm. Uh, you know, to which I said, you know, in the 1970s, we had 9% plus inflation two-thirds of the time. That's secular inflation. Mm. We had inflation of 9% for one month, and look what's happened. It's down to 3%. Uh, mm. The only other times historically where in a span of a, uh, call it... Um, uh, just over a year uh, that we've had inflation go down this much. Uh, only, it's only happened in uh, the uh, mid seventies, the early eighties, and in two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine. Uh, all were recessionary periods. We haven't even really had the technical recession yet. And look how far inflation has come down. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, global supply chains, uh, notwithstanding the ongoing war in the Ukraine. Um, that the global supply chains, those cost pressures uh, have abated. 
So I think that the one call I got right uh, was that inflation was going to come crashing down. I guess we could debate as to whether or not it's come down enough. The central bankers are tied to this holy grail of of 2%. So, mm-hmm. you know, you go from 9% to 3% and it's not good enough for today's central bankers because yeah. they, they're their badge of honor is yeah. two. And as Tiff Macklem said, the head of the Bank of Canada, that, you know, going down to three is one thing. That last leg down to two is going to be a lot tougher. And he's probably not wrong on that. Hmm. So I would say that that is uh, one call that we got right. Uh, the other call is that, uh, and it's I have to say that, no, I have not been bullish at all on the U.S. stock market. So I missed out on that. But we were pounding our fist uh, this time last year on Japan. And we saw Japan as a bona fide turnaround story with much better valuation metrics, but also the legacy of uh, Abenomics. Uh, there's an equity culture going on in Japan right now that looks a lot like the United States back in 1982. Uh, so, um, you know, the the um, you're not seeing corporate Japan hoard cash anymore. Uh, there's uh, activism taking place. There's regulatory uh, measures being taken place that's compelling uh, these very stodgy, cautious, conservative Japanese companies to start returning cash to shareholders. That's really the overall story. It's not really about the economy. It's not really about the weak yen, although that's certainly a boon to exporters. Um, but there is a re-rating going on in the Japanese stock market. And the first people that have caught on to it are global investors. They're the ones that have been buying. Uh, the locals in Japan have not caught on yet. Mm. Uh, so wait till that happens. So I think that those two calls, I think the disinflation call, uh, and uh, of course, you know, bond yields have backed up to the, in the past couple of weeks for a variety of reasons. But, um, you know, there was people... A year ago, saying we're going to five, six, seven percent on the ten-year note, and I pushed back hard against that view, and I still do. But I'd say that the disinflation momentum and uh, the bullish call in Japan uh, really played out very well for us over the past twelve months. Yeah, excellent. And uh, I think there was also uh, some thoughts around twelve to eighteen months, kind of the ten-year U.S. bond yield getting down to maybe two and a quarter. But having said that, uh, sometimes you know, being early uh eventually you're right and from what i've seen in your research uh work in the past it kind of r- reminds me reminiscent of uh the 2007 to 2009 period so right. are you still in the camp that we're going to have a recession number one and also um how bad it might it be at this point in, from what you're looking at in the, in the data well look it's a great question um you know, at this point last year, when you and I were talking, uh, the Fed was uh, barely halfway into its tightening cycle. The yield curve had only inverted the month before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was only in November uh, that the New York Fed's uh, three yield curve recession probability model moved above 70%. You know, so I hear people all the time saying, where's this recession already? Where's the recession? And all the people that were calling for recession were dead wrong. Um, you know, the, they weren't dead wrong. Uh, were they early? Well, I don't remember anybody putting an, exa- an exact time stamp on it. You know, when you and I were having this conversation a year ago, yep. all I said was, I said, you know, um, there's never been a Fed easing cycle that failed to promote an economic recovery. Nobody ever debates that. Uh, and not every single Fed tightening cycle necessarily leads to a recession. Uh, but we have had, um, 14 Fed rate hiking cycles since 1950. And these tightening cycles created the conditions for a recession 11 of those 14 times. So what I was saying back then, and I'll continue to say today is, you know, in this game of trying to help investors out and uh, now we're in the probability bands and trying to minimize making an error and always focusing on what the risks are, is that in a Fed tightening cycle, you stand an 80% chance of having a recession sometime thereafter. And we know the lags are long and variable and other things are happening at the same time. You've got this wonderful U.S. Uh, industrial policy, uh, the CHIPS Act. You had yep. the, the the final leg of the excess savings from all the mm-hmm. crazy uh, stimulus checks that were given to the proletariat back in uh, 2021. Um, and all that, of course, um, uh, helped thwart uh, the impact of the Fed so far, but it's still it's still early, uh, and the lags between the 
onset of the Fed tightening cycle, which remember was March of last year and the recession, is usually about two years. Uh, Mm -hmm. Now, it could be one year, it could be three years. We're just talking about the law of averages, but typically it's about 24 months. Mm -hmm. So the recession is still out there. We haven't seen the full impact of what the Fed has done. Uh, A lot of the impact was blunted this year by fiscal stimulus that is not going to be repeated in 2024. So I think the jury is still out. I'm I'm just amazed at the number of people that are thrown in the towel, the people that had my view uh, that throw in the towel. I think that they will regret it. It's one thing to say, well, it's taking longer this time. I, I mean, you, you talked about, yep. you know, back in 06, 07. Remember, the Fed started tightening in June of 04. Uh, the recession started in December of 07. Everybody was saying the same thing back then. In 06, that's all I lived at at Merrill Lynch. Where's this recession? Where's yep. this recession? Well, well, back then, it wasn't about fiscal policy that, you know, created the lag to be so mm-hmm. long. Uh, it was those other acronyms. Today's acronym is FOMO for the stock market. But back then, regarding the housing market, it was MEW. It was MU. It was mortgage equity withdrawal and cash out refinancing. So we still had that last leg, that last year. Uh, back in uh, 06 and 07, before the recession, people were still, you know, breathing the fumes from the uh, previous housing bubble. And so we've had the fiscal situation this year that's provided a bit longer of a lifeline for the expansion. But I'll just tell you, Thane, that um, uh, I have some hardcore beliefs. Uh, I believe that interest rates do matter. They matter for the economy. They matter for financial assets. How else do you value anything with a... Uh, a, a stream of cash flows if you don't have an idea of where interest rates are. So it's one yep. thing when interest rates are zero uh, and the mm-hmm. Fed has destroyed the equity risk premium entirely and you're going to have a jack in the beanstalk market rally, even in the context of the height of the COVID back in 2020. Think of the craziness in the economy uh, and in our lives back in March of 2020 and the stock market goes vertical north. Well, of course, shows you the power of interest rates. It's a funny thing. That when the Fed's cutting rates, um, everybody says, don't fight the Fed, don't fight the Fed, don't fight the mm-hmm. Fed. Uh, but you know, you know, in our business, which is built yep. on optimism at all times, when the Fed's raising rates, nobody says, mm-hmm. don't fight the Fed. Mm-hmm. It's always like, look, let's look somewhere else. But interest rates matter. Yeah. Interest rates matter a lot. And the economy resets to those interest rates with lags that can be 12, 24, 36 months. Okay, yep. so I think well, the recession is the recession has been delayed but not derailed, just like it was. Uh, it was delayed in 06. It started towards the tail end of 07. So I believe interest rates matter. Yep. And uh, I don't believe that the business cycle has been repealed. So I say that 100% true. The people that were calling for recession uh, are on their back heels. You could suggest that I'm one of those people, but. I haven't backed away from the view just because it hasn't happened yet. Uh, you know, remember I said that the New York Fed, you know, it's funny, John Williams is not an interest rate hike. He didn't vote for, <laughs> uh, or he voted for every one of them. Yeah. Uh, but this uh, recession model goes back 50 years. And when you cross over 70%, there's no turning back. You've always had a recession. Hmm. Uh, and um, it's usually call it uh, roughly a year after you cross a 70% mark. Well, we only crossed a 70% mark in this indicator last November. Hmm. So I'd say, you know what, uh, we know we know that the first quarter, 2.4% real GDP. We know that the Atlanta Fed, I think they're at 5.8 yep. right now. It's funny, the St. Louis Fed is at 0. 0.6. Hmm. And, um, and uh, or they're, no, they're, I think they're at 0.8. The other one's 5.8. There, somebody's got a decimal place in the wrong spot gotcha. in those two forecasts. But uh, I'd say the fourth quarter, if you're going to ask me anything, the fourth quarter, I, I sense we will be staring the recession in the face at that point. And the reality is the data is lagging too at that point too, right? So it's only confirmed subsequent and over time. Um, as right. to whether or not, you know, so that's... That's one of the things that I think people have to kind of uh, wrap their minds around. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. We're with David Brosenberg, so stay with us. We'll be right back. Want to know how Canada's top industry leaders feel about creating significant wealth in the world around them? Find out with me, Thane Stenner, founder of Center Wealth Partners at Canaccord Genuity and host of the new Smart Wealth Podcast, available on iHeart or anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. Subscribe now. Welcome back, everybody. I'm with David Rosenberg as my special guest. And we're going to get right back into it. 
you wrote, you penned a, a column in the Financial Post recently. I think it was the Financial Post where I, I think you mentioned something along, along the lines of uh, reminding yourself back in the 07 period where I think you were called a, the skunk at the picnic, so to speak. And I'm saying this with a lot of respect because you wrote it. Um, yes. But are you feeling like maybe just describe why you, you penned that column recently? Um, kind of what was behind it and maybe share a little bit as to the historical relevance of that column. Well, look, it's a matter of, um, of uh, you know, social media um has its uh i guess you could say it's pluses and its minuses um and uh so when, when you're out there and uh you're a personality and you have uh and you're opinionated um you know you're going to uh get uh sometimes you know great comments that support your view but uh, at points when you're viewed as completely wrong and in the wilderness you're it's open season Mm. open season on the bears and yep. so uh the hate mail for example oh the, the hate mail uh has been incredible i i think that uh i think it was uh jacob that said to me dad uh you, you don't want to check your twitter account uh for the last couple of days because <laughs> yeah, it's, I, 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 it's gotten yeah, hostile i i yeah it's, i i mean i like i said to him you're, you're not embarrassed and i'm your father are you so uh but you know it was it was it was that um you know, because the same thing happened uh, at Merrill. It wasn't, it wasn't the first time. The first time at Merrill was in 2000 when I, people yep. called me a Luddite because I didn't understand uh, the power of the internet. Like yes. today, I don't. Today, I don't understand the power of AI. I don't understand the power of the Biden Chips Act. I don't understand any of this. Uh, yeah. But I just know. I know that uh, there are there are things that have long term productivity impacts, and then there are things that also in the here and now create. The conditions for financial asset bubble mm. so in any event um it just uh everything i'm seeing right now especially the the all everybody throwing in the towel everybody and everybody in 07 threw in the towel the, there was the, no, caution, the, caution, no, no, no. the cautionary towel is what you're saying the, yeah the recession towel yeah i think the yes. only two people left standing were me and dick burner who was chief economist to morgan stanley every yeah, <laughs> they were still i mean uh, their consensus did not stall, start to call for the recession until yeah. Fannie and Freddie went down for the count in yep. conservatorship, and that was in July of 08. Even after Bear Stearns went down, soft landing, the consensus was soft landing the whole way through. Um, and the recession started in in December of 07. Nobody knew about it. And that's what I mean. Recessions are like, like, they're like an odorless gas. You know, oh, you know, they they catch up on you. Uh, and you're right. You get the re you get the revised data. People haven't talked about the fact that non-farm payrolls, the holy grail of all yep. the economic data, yep. they have been revised down every month this year. The back data have been revised down every month this year by a total of two hundred and seventy thousand. So I, I say to people, you trade. Do you understand? You are trading off a number on eight thirty in the morning on Friday. That yep. is fictitious. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's and and the same thing with GDP. All these things get revised. We've actually been in a recession on GDI, gross domestic income, the actual money that we make, because we've been in a profits recession for the yes. better part of the past year. We've been in an earnings, uh, we've been in a an income recession, but GDP is all about spending. Yep. Uh, and so, uh, with the uh, the help of the lagged impact of the. Uh, uh, of the fiscal stimulus checks and the uh, the binge we've been seeing in terms of uh, credit card usage, uh, that's created um, the allure of prosperity because we look at GDP. Mm. And we always measure the economy based on spending. But if you looked at real income in aggregate, we've mm. actually been in recession. And it's very unusual, by the mm. way, to have what's called GDP and GDI diverge by as much as it has. So these will hmm. ultimately get reconciled in the national accounts. Gotcha. Uh, so, you know, let's just say that, um, that uh, I I'm feeling the heat, uh, but uh, I'm uh, to quote Tom Petty. Uh, I'm not going to back down mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to maintain my resolve because I did that in 2000 when I was called a Luddite. 
Mm-hmm. And I was proven right because the recession game in 2001, when nobody saw it coming, including Alan Greenspan, no matter mm-hmm. how smart he is. Yep. And uh, and then in 07, I was called the skunk at the picnic. Uh, <laughs> and look, that's the thing. That's just what they said to my face. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so uh, I sort of um, thought, you know what? Okay, time to start uh, dusting off the books and just saying to everybody, I have been here before. Uh, I have a good handle on what's happening. Uh, I understand this recession in a classical sense has not started yet. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm also keeping an eye on the leading indicators. As you mentioned, everybody's focused on coincident and lagging indicators. By the way, so is the Fed. So is the Bank of Canada. They've been so shamed by missing the inflation that they are not going to risk anything. That, that inflation gene, that that inflation, that genie's going back in the bottle for good, and they're going to yeah. over tighten. And they still, they they already probably already have. Which uh, actually leads me to my next point. Yeah. You think there will be an overshoot of this tightening cycle? I, I guess is it, it's happened. It's happened. When you when you tighten policy this much into an inverted yield curve, it's a it's a fait accompli. As I say on the Quebec side of the border, les jeux sont faits. The gig is up. Mm-hmm. It's just a matter of lags. The reason when I said before that you've had 14 Fed rate hiking cycles, but 11 recessions. I didn't say 14 recessions. Uh, we had three real soft landings. We had three periods where the recession was averted for years, and that was in the mid 60s, the mid 80s, and, and the mid 90s. Mm. Uh, the mid 90s, of course, was that period where uh, Alan Greenspan. Uh, developed the moniker of uh, the maestro. But you see, what made those three periods special was that the Fed and the Bank Canada stopped hiking rates before the yield curve inverted. These hmm. central banks, because they are so consumed with inflation, have continued to raise rates well past the point of inversion of the yield curve. Hmm. And there's nothing magical about the yield curve except it's a price signal from the bond market that tells a central bank you've gone too far. I don't think people understand how abnormal it is Mm. to have a situation where short-term interest rates are above long-term interest rates. Anybody who studied the time value of money knows that that is unnatural. And it has only happened 15% of the time in the past. And it only happens when the Fed or the Bank Canada raises rates so aggressively that they take short-term rates above long-term rates. Only happens 15% of the time, but it's the bond market's way of saying, uncle, to the yes. central bank. So in answer to your question, I know it's not evident to the naked eye today. Uh, you look at this number, look at that number, they're all contemporaneous indicators. They're not suggesting anything nefarious. I spend most of my time trying to forecast uh, what the headlines are going to read three, six, and 12 months from now. Uh, I'm not trying to forecast what the headlines read today. We already know that. We already know what's happening today. Mm. Uh how is the outlook being shaped? Uh, that's really what's important. And that's what I'm focusing my attention on. So let's let's drill down a little bit deeper on that. Three, six, nine, twelve months. Let's let's just go with twelve months. Twelve months from now, what would be some of the headlines that would not surprise you, or that you think we'll be reading? I think we'll be reading about um, that the recession is here. I think that if you give me a twelve month window, and, and that's being charitable, <laughs> but economists like. Big windows. I know, I know. I know. I Big windows for us to fall out of. <laughs> but um, but I think that, you know, if, if look, if, if if the recession doesn't come in a 12-month span, uh, I will write a report saying it is a new era, interest rates don't matter, and the business cycle has been repealed, and I will be uh, I will be um, uh, eating a lot of crow and wiping a lot of egg off my face. Uh, I, I think it's a little early to make that assertion, but I think in the next year we'll be writing about rising unemployment, We'll be writing about deflation, not inflation, deflation. Mm. And uh, that's why I've not abandoned my call for where the 10-year note's going to go down to 2 2.5%. Of course, it hasn't happened, dot, 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 yet. I, I heard that all throughout 06 and 07. Yep. I heard that all throughout 1999 and 2000. You have to sometimes just be patient and maintain yep. some resolve. Yep. Uh, I just find that so many of people in the marketplace today <laughs> – you know, that's yeah, why I love the, the, the Robin Hood accounts. You know, it was it was a great sociological um, uh, Experiment. development, you know, that that the, the degree of narcissism and the short term nature of investing today or forecasting. We're talking about where the next big move, the next big move in interest rates is going to be down, not up. And that's true across the curve. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think we'll be talking about lower interest rates. Uh, I think this notion of the central banks, they're telling us, central banks are telling us higher for longer, higher for longer. Mm-hmm. That's what they want us to hear right now. Yes. They were also telling us in 2021 that interest rates were going to stay at zero and to perpetuity. And in inflation fact, in fact, when they when they first unveiled the <clears throat> dot plot, the Fed unveiled the dot plot in 2021 for the end of uh, this year, it was five eighths of a percent. Whoa, that's and right it's, too. And we're that's now right what too. five and a quarter, five and yeah. a half. Oops. Yeah, they, so yeah, yeah. They so the, they let's the just the uh, <laughs> let's just uh, you know I, I'm not I shouldn't really sit here in a glass house and throw stones, but let's just say that I'm going. I know the Fed wants us. They want us to believe rates are going to stay at zero, and then that didn't happen. Then they want us to believe that rates are going to stay elevated for a prolonged period of time. I don't think that's going to happen because interest rates at their root uh, are cyclical. And I think we are past peak inflation. I think we are past peak of economic growth. I think we are certainly past peak of the credit cycle. I think you're going to be hearing a lot about uh, the tightness and financial conditions. We just talked about the Fed and the cost of credit. But every survey is telling you something about the availability of credit. And I find it, it well, look what's happening right now with Fitch. Now, Fitch didn't stop with the U.S. government, did it? Now it's going no. after the banks. Yep. Well, this there. This is what I'm, we're, we're going to go back. It's like, you know, we went back and thought, oh, boy, you know, 2007, January of 07, what happened? That was like a uh, canary in the coal mine. What was that? It was when New Century Financial yes. uh, closed its doors. January of 07, the recession started about a year later. The stock market didn't peak till October of 07. And so that to me was always a flashpoint. New hmm. Century Financial, like, who are those guys? Well, mm-hmm. countrywide, countrywide ended up following them. They were a, 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 a significant subprime lender, not the biggest in the business, but that was a flashpoint. So we're, you, you, you're going to tell me, and I'm just saying this, I, I'm pausing yeah. this, talking to the yeah. third person. You're going to tell me that we just, we had a, some non, some pretty significant regional banks close their doors and shutter, uh, you know, back in, back in March. And, yep. and we're going to look back and we're going to say, oh, yeah. Why didn't I pay attention to that? And so we are seeing that when you're taking a look at bank wide, and of course we got Jamie Dimon and Brian Moynihan going on CNBC with their smiling faces. They know what's going on. You see these banks, they're raising their loan loss provisioning like it's nobody's business. They know they know a, a credit default cycle is coming down the pike. Look what they're doing with their loan loss reserves. Yes. And they will continue to do that. Uh, we're already starting to see uh, auto loan default rates and credit card default rates already go back to uh, their early pandemic highs. Hmm. Uh, and so we are seeing the onset of a credit contraction. And I know it's not showing up right now in the data, but there are lags involved. We have the cost of credit, rates up 500 basis points, and we have the availability of credit. If you're taking a look at bank assets and bank liabilities in the United States, they're running negative year on year. The banks are shrinking their balance sheets mm. and nobody's talking about it. So mm. we're going into uh, what will they be writing about? Um, an, a, a negative credit cycle, default rates going up, uh, recession, rising unemployment, uh, deflation, and the central banks uh, will be cutting rates. Nobody ever thought that they'd be cutting rates in 2007. Well, they did. Nobody ever thought they'd be cutting rates in 01. Well, they did. Nobody ever thought they'd be cutting rates in 1990. Well, they did because interest rates are cyclical. So that's what we'll be talking about. And then we don't know what the geopolitics are going to look like. Uh, The war, the Russia-Ukraine war is not going away. Uh, What what are the next chapters in that war? What's Putin uh, going to do as he gets painted into a corner? What's happening in China? How does their economic, they're heading into recession. What about China? We haven't talked about China yet, Thane. Yep. Well, how much China now is heading into its credit crunch, and they look like they're going into recession. Uh, everybody talked about global decoupling. Uh, back when I was at Merrill in 06 and 07, uh, people were saying, well, don't worry. If the U.S. goes into recession, we have global decoupling. Look at China. But look, look what happened. There's no such thing as global decoupling. Yep. Back then, it was the world's largest economy that had the reverberating impact around the world. And this time around, it's the second biggest economy. China, what's happening in China right now is very serious. And um, the trade channel implications for the rest of Asia, into Europe, 
And then, of course, in the United States, the implications for commodities, which are very negative, and the implications that has for Canada, Canadian profits, uh, the Canadian dollar. What's happening in China, that's going to be making the headlines. It always, it already is. Mm. Uh, but that story hasn't played out yet. And mm-hmm. Beijing hasn't come up with a policy solution yet to their property mess uh, and their debt situation, yep. um, which is getting worse. And obviously, that's people were expecting, look, the story, the story for this year, the bulls had the story for this year with the China reopening trade. Mm-hmm. Now, part of that's worked because you know that the casinos in Macau have been filled. But yep. um, everything else, I mean, yeah. look at the retail sales numbers. Yep. Uh, look at the manufacturing numbers. Uh, and look at the real estate. The housing market there is deflating. So China, to me, if you're asking me that, and, that, and then, of course, um, how this is going to filter in geopolitically uh, to Xi Jinping uh, and how would he get the masses, um, how will they get their minds off the economic problems? And then all of a sudden you throw Taiwan into the mix. And I don't want to sound like I'm stepping over my bounds as an economist uh you know i'm a more of a of a keen student on geopolitics history but, and history well yeah these are the things um you know wag the dog yep. uh that you have to um be uh you know be aware of but i'd say in answer to your question i think that um as everybody is focused on inflation uh, we've gone from nine percent to three percent in the united states uh the numbers in canada are higher because of course when mortgage interest costs are in the CPI in Canada and yep. mortgage interest costs are up 30% because the bank's raising interest rates, the, the bank is actually creating its own inflation. The numbers in Canada are being inflated because of the way that the CPI is constructed. But we, I, I strongly believe, and again, I am probably crazy early on this call understood, but I'm always more uh, concentrated on the big calls, the big moves, and the little wiggles along the trend line. I don't care about the wiggles. Let the traders and the technical people worry about the wiggles on the trend line. Yeah. Uh, I think that um, this decline in inflation has not been fully appreciated by the bond market, not fully appreciated by the central banks. And I think as the, de- the, de- the deflation, which is this disinflation now becomes deflation, and China is going to be the linchpin for that. And gotcha. that's why I'm very bullish to this day uh, on long Canada's, and I'm very bullish on long treasuries. We're going to take a quick break right now. Please stay with us. And David Rosenberg will be right back. Want to know how Canada's top industry leaders feel about creating significant wealth in the world around them? Find out with me, Thane Stenner, founder of Center Wealth Partners at Canaccord Genuity, and host of the new Smart Wealth Podcast, available on iHeart or anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. Subscribe now. Welcome back, everybody. I'm here with David Rosenberg. Let's get right back to it. So I've got three other themes that I kind of want to focus in our discussion on near and dear to people's hearts, uh, the real estate market, both in the U.S. and Canada, and maybe juxtapose for our audience around maybe the similarities, but also the differences as to where they're at in the U.S. versus where the Canadian real estate market might be today. Well, you know, the, the residential real estate markets in both countries uh, up until very recently have been very strong uh, for different reasons. Uh, in Canada, of course, uh, it's been the uh, massive uh, immigration inflows. Uh, you know, Canada has uh, uh, amongst the worst fertility and birth rates. We're like right there with Europe or everybody else in the industrialized world, but we've been up for it with immigration. And when you have immigrants come in, unlike, you know, giving birth to a child, you know, you 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 give birth to a uh, baby, you put the baby in the crib. The crib already has a roof over its head. Mm. Uh, but when people come in from outside the country, they create uh, housing demand right away. Mm-hmm. And the housing demand in Canada has been uh, phenomenal. And, uh, of course, principally in Vancouver and Toronto, because that's where people who come in from outside the country, that's where they want to live. Uh, and so we've had that aspect of it uh, on the demand side. And because of the dearth of construction workers, um, we have been able to keep up on the supply side. I mean, there's other reasons too. You can argue about at the municipal level, zoning restrictions, the provincial level, uh, land use restrictions. But the bottom line is that the supply uh, has uh, not kept up with the demand. And the demand has been demographic and come from immigration. And we can talk about whether that makes sense or not. Uh, but that's what has driven the housing bubble in Canada. Hmm. Uh, and now you have a situation where affordability is out of control because you have higher mortgage rates and you have prices and nosebleed levels, and it's not sustainable. 
But for whatever reason, in the last few months, you started to see a bit of a thaw on the supply side. And it may finally be thing that the weak hands are starting to have to, um, uh, you know, uh, list their house. Because you're starting to see for the first time in Toronto and Vancouver, new listings coming to the fore. Inventory starting to come back for whatever reason. And you would have thought at some point this had to happen because of the majority of Canadians that uh, we were always so conservative taking out five-year mortgages, but everybody took out short-term mortgages to take advantage of those ultra low rates a couple of years ago. Yep. Uh, and uh, and now they're going to be paying the piper. So I, I still, I continue to think that, you know, we could be in for some trouble here in Canadian residential real estate. Uh, and I'm saying in terms of housing price deflation, I, I mean, look, if we don't get help from interest rates by the bank Canada, and it doesn't look like that's going to come soon, the only way you're going to mean revert uh, the homeowner affordability ratio in this country, you know, barring some sort of massive income boom, which isn't going to happen now that the unemployment rate is starting to go up. Uh, home prices in Canada have to come down roughly 30%, mm. right? Just to mm -hmm. equilibrate something as mm -hmm. basic as the affordability ratio, it only has three variables, interest rates, uh, home yep. prices, and incomes. Yep. The United States, uh, totally different. It's not an immigration story. It, it, what happened is that in Canada, as everybody flocked to variable rate mortgages, um, Americans back in 2020 locked in. 85% mm -hmm. of Americans locked in. They locked in their two to three percent mortgage rates, and they're stuck now. They're and that's why. Well, that's why there's no inventory. Nobody, nobody. Yeah. You can't you, you can't list your house because then you're going to be uh, having to take on a new mortgage. It's seven and a half percent. Problem and that's two, why. Two so it's three. created. Well, so you've got this other perverse in both countries for different reasons. You have extremely tight supply. In Canada, mm -hmm. it's been the immigration story. In the U.S., it's been the fact that everybody refinanced and they realize. I can't move out of this home or else my mortgage rate's going to go up five percentage points from where yep. I last took it on. So yep. that's why there's no inventory. Uh, but once again, look, at, at some point, um, uh, there's going to be a straw that breaks the camel's back because you have the same unaffordable housing situation in the United States. It's crazy. You know mm -hmm. that housing, uh, housing affordability in the United States is more stretched today than it was at the peak of the housing bubble back in 2006. Now, I'm just going to say, this is a mean reverting series. Everybody on the call knows I'm a Bob Farrell disciple. Rule number yep. one is about mean reversion ratios, not levels, but ratios mean revert. When people say to me, how did you end up getting the housing call right when you were at Merrill in 06 and 07? The real miracle was that I held on to my job. Um, but <laughs> all I did was, was I believed in fundamentals and basic premises and the laws of nature. One law of nature is the law of mean reversion. So mm. I'm sort of wondering, like, something's got to give here, okay, Thane, in both countries. Either yep. we have to go through a big income boom, but those days have passed. The unemployment rate's not going down further than it already has. The yep. income boom, that's not happening. And the central bankers seem to just basically want to continue to talk as if they're never going to cut interest rates. Mm. So what's left in the equation? Our home prices mm. and to just to mean revert and that means going to the mean by the way uh when you mean revert yeah. historically you go through the mean in both directions you're talking about a minimal 30 percent decline in home prices and all i have is people talking to me about uh the ai boom here the chips act here yep. nobody's factored in uh the you know where home prices the bedrock <clears throat> of yep. the household balance sheet in both countries, the bedrock, actually, yep. of the assets in the banking system. Yep. Uh, and so there's another headline that nobody's talking about that yep. will be making the headlines in the next 12 months yep. so is say, deflation say, in residential yep. real estate. Yep. And that's why, ultimately, the mean reversion, is. there's not a snowball's chance in health aim that the mean reversion is going to happen only by home prices. They will be cutting interest rates. Yep. They might not want to cut interest rates, they're not going to have a choice. Got it. So the 30% potential mean decline, that would be off of the peak of February 22 is, I think, just to clarify that. Yeah, so from, from the so, peak, but I mean, yeah. so so we're talking 25%. I mean, yeah, we're correct. talking peak to trough. Correct, correct. We barely come off the highs. I agree. I agree. Um, and I won't say the name, but even in today's Globe and Mail, there was a, uh, another article around one of Canada's largest mix 
uh, further gating and reducing distributions. And I, again, I won't say the name, just uh, it's not appropriate, but basically things are tightening, right? Things are definitely tightening from what, what we're seeing as well. The U.S. was said to be requiring to refinance or issue close to $2 trillion worth of treasuries here in the next few years. Yeah. Um, and we've had Fitch just downgrade them. Um, what are your thoughts around how the U.S. is going to work their way through this debt issue? Part, part of me thinks that there has to be a very strong bias for the government and the Fed to drop rates because their interest costs are going through the roof. So am I right in that scenario? Like there's, that's not, it's not something they're telegraphing right now, but you know, what are they going to do with this debt? Cause, cause the math is the math and we're seeing this dramatic hockey stick in the level of debt in the U S and Canada for that matter. What would be your thoughts to share there? Well, look, the, the fed, the fed does not report to the treasury. Uh, the fed reports to Congress. Yep. The Federal Reserve Act is an act of Congress. So, uh, I, I mean, the, the way that this would work through interest rates is that what we're going to be left with in the future is a complete lack of flexibility in terms of fiscal policy making, and we're going to be operating under some intense budget, budgetary constraints. Um, so, and so far as that leads to what economists call this fiscal drag or fiscal restraint, it's going to act as a depressant on aggregate demand growth that will be disinflationary. And that's the process that gets the Fed to start cutting interest rates. The Fed's not going to cut interest rates to help out Uncle Sam. Gotcha. Uh, it's going to come through the impact on the economy. And that's exactly what we're talking about. You know, firstly, everybody's talking about Fitch, 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 Fitch. Uh, so, so the U.S. is double A plus. So what? Big deal. Canada's double A plus. Okay. So what? Big deal. Uh, do you really think that uh, the world's reserve currency is going to default on its debt? It's just basically symbolic. Um, you know, uh, do you remember when uh, the, uh, the the U.S. got downgraded um, by uh, Moody? I, by Moody's back in 2011? I mean, yeah. most people don't even remember that. Yeah. But you see what that did. You see that ended up being a splash of cold water on the fiscal activists in Washington. It dramatically strengthened the Tea Party in the Republican Party, just like what Fitch has done is going to be disinflationary or deflationary because it's now going to embolden uh, the Freedom Caucus. Mm -hmm. in the Republican Party, and people aren't paying attention. The, you didn't ask me this part. This this will not be in the paper in the next 12 months, but it will be in the next month. We could be facing a, gov a partial government shutdown um, by the end of September. Yep. Um, so what this, if you go back to that period, why, why, that, um, as, why that Moody's downgrade was so important back in the summer of 2011 uh, was because it forced Barack Obama, who's every much an interventionist in the economy as Joe Biden is. Mm -hmm. um, but remember that there are checks and balances. Um, Obama yep. at that point didn't have full control. Yep. Uh, and uh, Biden is not doesn't have full control, nor is he likely to after the presidential elections. And what happened was that in the summer 2011, uh, the U.S. was running a deficit to GDP ratio of uh, 8%. And in the next five years, it went down to 3%. Mm. And that's huge fiscal drag yep. that kept GDP growth low. And uh, it allowed for a huge rally in bonds. And the and the Fed just basically was out of the picture. Mm. So uh, and they kept rates at zero through the entire piece. So yes. you got to think that if there's any significance from the Fitch situation, the downgrade, which is symbolic, but... You know, it was an important symbolic move. Uh, and uh, as you said, the rollover of all this debt, three quarters of the debt rolling over in the next five years, 
and interest rates that will be higher than they were upon origination means mm-hmm. that debt service costs, it means that all the revenues coming into the government are going to be siphoned off to pay interest. Yep. That's going to leave less money for fun and games and goods and services. And that's going to be a, a debt weight drag on GDP growth. So while well, people said to me, well, bond yields went up because of this or that because of Fitch. Um, well, maybe in a static setting, a very knee-jerk, myopic reaction, bond yields go up. Uh, I would say if you believe that bond yields went up because of Fitch, you want to be buying those bonds because this will prove to be as disinflationary a, an event as Moody's was 12 years ago. Hmm. Interesting. So final question for you, uh, relating this back to the markets, um, how to make money for investors, right? You've, you've worked for uh, you know, a very large Wall Street firm uh, very successfully. Uh, Glasgow Chef, you did a very good job in a leadership role there. If you were handed $10 million today, just pick a number, um, I don't want specific recs because you don't, it's not appropriate, but what would you, how would you be allocating that personally based upon what's in your head and what you think's coming? Well, Thane, if, if I had $10 million, I'd buy your love. <laughs> uh, I think that, uh, well, here, here, here's where uh, I, I would be advocating. This is where I'm putting my own money. And I think yep. that you really do this through ETFs. But um, uh, I think that energy, uh, I'd say all forms of energy. Uh, and I would say certainly anything related, uh, very bullish on natural gas and energy infrastructure. Uh, the greening of the world is not going away. Mm-hmm. So I would say that um, that energy ETFs, I'd have a chunk in there. Yep. Uh, I think that uh, as we're grappling with geopolitical uncertainty, uh, a U.S. dollar, which has been looking wobbly, a great hedge against uh, currency debasement, uh, but also because I believe that real interest rates will be coming down, uh, I want to own gold. Uh, and the question is, do you want to own the the junior mining companies? Do you want to yep. own gold bars? My, my last yep. trade has been buying um, uh, gold coins uh, from uh, the Royal Canadian Mint and storing it in the vault. So hmm. I'd say gold exposure um, is important. I like long bonds because we're past the peak of growth, inflation, and credit. Yep. And I think the central banks will be pushed to ease policy in the next 12 months. I want to own long bonds. And I don't mind having cash, too. You're getting paid more than 5% to be in cash. Aerospace defense. Look, we talked a lot about uh, Ukraine. We talked a lot yep. about Taiwan. Um, defense budgets are going up around the world. That is a global theme. Uh, and, uh, you know, we just recently got the U.S. industrial production numbers. And if you're taking a look at output in the United States, that's in a bona fide bull market. Uh, it is definitely in aerospace defense. That's another area you want to pay attention to. Um, bull, market, bull market in defense is, in essence. Yeah, you, so, so defense, energy, um, uh, our gold, uh, bonds. I'd be looking at all those. I, I think the Japanese stock markets and the secular bull market, that to me, if there's a buy and hold, you can buy the Nakai, you can buy the topics. Uh, I think that... You know, um, there's worse places to have your toes in, um, you know, uh, where Warren Buffett uh, already is. And so uh, I think that that's uh, Japan is in a secular bull market. And I'll tell you that um, I'm, I'm starting to like the Canadian equity market uh, quite a bit. It's um, the all in yield is so much stronger than it is in the United States. The all in cash yield uh, the valuations in Canada, 1314 against 1920 in the United States. If I have to be a um, fully invested in the stock market, uh, I certainly would be taking profits out of the U.S. and deploying them in Japan and even save some for Canada because the valuation metrics here are, are just so compelling. What about emerging uh, markets? What about no, emerging, emerging well, you know, as my as, as my mentor and friend Don Cox always said, emerging markets are markets that you can't emerge from in an emergency. And uh, and and a lot of them are trading very inexpensively, admittedly, especially Hong Kong. But 
Uh, Thane, if you're worried about China like I am, uh, yeah. there, there's the, 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 what looks like an attractive PE multiple over there is just a value trap. Um, I think if I want to be in Asia right now, I mean, India is another secular story, but it's more expensive than Japan on a relative mm -hmm. uh, basis. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, Japan is not an emerging market. It doesn't have liquidity problems. Uh, it's actually Japan is benefiting uh, maybe you can argue perversely, but it is benefiting from the problems that China is having right now. Uh, so I don't mind buying a market that's benefiting from China's problems. I just don't want to be buying markets that are right in the crossfire of China's problems. And that's the problems with uh, um, with emerging Asia, for example. Um, you know, Latin America, of course, that is a, a call on commodities uh, frankly, uh, if China goes into a recession, which is now looking likely, commodities will have question marks in front of them. But if I want to have a toehold in something that is commodity-like, I'd rather just own the TSX than go into the uh, emerging Latin America market. So well, there you have it. You have, yeah. you have energy, yeah. you have gold, you have aerospace defense, uh, you have uh, long bonds, uh, have some cash on hand. Uh, yep. I think I mentioned gold, Canada, Japan, and uh, yep. I'm out of breath. <laughs> well, listen, thank you very much, David. We could talk for uh, hours and hours. Uh, always uh, very interested in hearing your views. Keep up the great work uh, on your research. And and uh, once again, you know, it's rosenbergresearch.com. You can go to their website, uh, check it out. I can uh, personally and professionally vouch for uh, all the good work that David and his team do. And uh, thank you once again, David, for taking the time and uh, look forward to seeing the uh Skunk at the picnic uh, comments uh, <laughs> later. Talk soon. All the best. Thanks the again. Thanks again. Thanks, David. Bye-bye yeah. for now. Listen, everybody, if you want to find out more about Stenner Wealth Partners of CG Wealth Management, our website is StennerWealthPartners.com. That's StennerWealthPartners.com. Have a take, take a look and uh, welcome any questions. Have a great day, everybody. The comments and opinions expressed in this podcast are the results of work done by Stenner Wealth Partners. They may differ from the opinion of Canaccord Genuity Corp. and should not be considered as representative of Canaccord's beliefs, opinions, or recommendations. All views expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and do not constitute an offer or solicitation to buy or sell any securities. The statements expressed herein are not intended to provide tax, legal, or financial advice, and under no circumstances should be construed as a solicitation to act as a securities broker or dealer in any jurisdiction. All views are intended for general circulation only and do not have any regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or general needs of any particular person, organization, or institution. Canaccord is a member of the CIPF. The comments expressed in this podcast are the results of work done by Stenner Wealth Partners. They may differ from the opinion of Canaccord Genuity Corp. and should not be considered as representative of Canaccord's beliefs, opinions, or recommendations. All views expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and do not constitute an offer or solicitation to buy or sell any securities. The statements expressed herein are not intended to provide tax, legal, or financial advice and under no circumstances should be construed as a solicitation to act as a securities broker or dealer in any jurisdiction. All views are intended for general circulation only and do not have any regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or general needs of any particular person, organization, or institution. Canaccord is a member of the CIPF.